Good morning. I'm Umar. Umar Iqbal. Uh, I work on Identity Experience Framework. I think we should probably get started. It's already around 10.45. And uh, yesterday I had somebody come and tell me that they really enjoyed my session. And then they went to watch a different session. And then they came back and said, hey, I watched, jo I watched John's session. So I am degrading the, uh, the rating of your session. So <laughs> this is going to be a little bit boring session, but hopefully informational enough. <laughs> so I was telling him I cannot match John's sessions because John does improv. So I don't know how many of you know, he's like, he's amazing with sessions. So this will be a little bit boring, but basically what we are going to do is we're going to go over customizing the user experience, a little bit about how uh, uh, it works in uh, advanced policies and custom policies. And we'll also go over some user journeys. And then in order to go through that, we will touch a few other topics uh, like claim types and how do they play into the system. Ronnie is going to then talk about uh, key management. Uh, uh, there is a portal aspect to key management and then there's a reference in technical profiles. So at the end of the session, he'll go over uh, key management, how the keys are uploaded and everything. And then uh, when we cover technical profiles and claims providers in the next session, uh, which is in the afternoon, I'll also try to tie it up with how keys are referenced inside the policies. So this is our goal for today's session, uh, trying to customize the user experience and change the flow execution of the user journey. Uh, to uh, create your own uh, user uh, specific to your requirements and very different user journey but i we do i don't i don't think we'll have enough time to actually go and demo one so i won't be able to go and manipulate the xml and then say let's create a phone number sign up for example or or uh, some specific migration scenario those samples exist separately um, uh, but in this i will just go through enough of elements and what each one of them means that uh, hopefully, you guys will have enough knowledge to be able to go back and start modifying and try with some understanding of what, what the implications of that modification is. We do assume that by this time, you have already done some built-in policies, you have already done some uh, custom policies, you were able to download a starter pack, modify it, have something working. The question, is, the question would be, have you already customized claims? I don't know if you guys have tried that or not. I will go through that. But if you have, uh, if you have tried it, good. Ask any questions you might have during the session. Uh, same thing about identity providers. If you have already added some identity providers and you have questions while we discuss input claims, output claims, feel free to ask questions. Uh, these are this is these are some of the items that we'll cover. Uh, I'll actually uh, get to the next step. Uh, this uh, this image uh, was shown yesterday by Jose. This goes through the big XML policy and all the sections that exist in that XML policy. So we have, for example, building blocks is one section. It has claim schema, claims transformations, content definitions, uh, client definitions, localization. In this session, I will touch three of those. I'll go in, uh, in depth into claim schema. What each uh, each part of the claim schema means and how it's interpreted by IEF. I'll go through claims transformation, how it uses claim schema, and then how claims transformations are applied to claims providers and technical profiles. And then we will discuss a little bit of user journeys. And towards the end, as I had mentioned earlier, Ronnie will go through key management, which has a portal experience to it. And then we'll figure out how to tie that into technical profiles. So let's start with claims and transformations. If you open the starter pack, this is how a typical claim definition will look like. So this is a display name, uh, claim type. This is uh, used uh, typically to capture a user, how the user wants their display name to show up, um, typically different from their legal name. The elements, uh, I, the reason I picked it up is, uh, is because it almost has everything that is needed. So this claim is uh, stored in the directory, in the starter pack. When you create a new user, a user signs up or signs in. We can we collect it from the user. So th there's a page that shows up where user types a display name. It is stored in the directory. And it can also be sometimes be retrieved from other identity providers like uh, Facebook or Google. So depending on user settings and the uh, permissions that the user has given to the application, we might be able to get a display name from Facebook into our system. And then we will try to pre-populate it. If there is a page that says, I, I want to collect uh, let's say the app, app wants to collect the display name from the user, and we already retrieved a display name from Facebook or Google, we, we will try to pre-populate it as well. 
the display the display name of the display name is called display name that is what will show on any ui that the user sees today that ui is uh, is a self asserted provider i'll go into all these providers in detail self asserted provider is essentially in the flow uh, the user is shown a uh, any time the user is shown a page by ief and they have to type some input we call that self asserted provider because the underlying implementation uh, the protocol provider we have is named self asserted protocol provider the logic being that those are the claims the user is asserting themselves so they can be a claim that comes from an identity provider from for example facebook and then there are claims that the user is asserting i'm asserting my first name is this i'm asserting my display name is this so the display name uh, the string display space name will show up on any page that user sees in their user journey the data type is string we use this in different uh, encodings that we have for whether we are sending a request to an identity provider or when we get back a response so typically uh, jwt tokens are json encoded and in json encoding uh, a string is encoded differently from a date time which is encoded differently from a from a number uh, what happens in string is you have two quotes around it but if you encode a number or a boolean you will not have uh, quotes around it and date time has a different format so this data type is actually used for all those different types of encodings if at any time let's say ief gets a response from an identity provider let's say facebook and a claim is declared as a string in ief but when we try to decode json we find that it's a number in that response ief will throw an error runtime error saying i was expecting something else i i don't know how to interpret this number or uh, this claim so that is how the data type is used the default partner claim types a partner a claim type is essentially a mapping of what's a what a claim is in ief versus what comes from the partner i'll go into more detail with all the different rules uh, i have a, a separate slide on that but conceptually i would want you to understand that uh, understand this now because we'll discuss uh, the partner claim types Uh, and different implications of that let's say um a claim is being sent to uh, an external idp facebook in ief it is called display name but in facebook it is called uh, let's say just name the partner claim type tells ief what to put in that json request or what to interpret from a json response that might come from an idp So let's say uh, Facebook issues a JWT token. We look at the token. We say that there is a name claim, and there's a display name. Based on this schema, because the partner claim type for protocol OpenID Connect is name, we will only look at the name claim. We'll ignore the display name completely in the response that comes from Facebook. But in the in, in IEF, it will still be called display name because that is what the claim type we are declaring. so there are literally two different sets of claims that we have to deal with one is sort of normalized claims that are in ief at run time we are managing that's the claim type id we have at the top that's the id for ief and then there's a partner claim type that is that can vary depending on each partner this claim schema is providing the default if i do not go and declare Uh, a partner claim type for a given idp it will just come here look at the protocol that that idp is using and then use that so if uh, i was interacting with google using auth2 the token will look at uh, the code will look at the token and try to find unique underscore name but if it was talking to google using open id connect it will actually try to find name and the reason we chose that uh, the, the way it's documented is because there is a client profile for um, jwt tokens open id connect and that sort of has some defaults it goes through a bunch of claims and says this is what it should be it's 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 i think one of the rfcs so open id connect is supposed to be name and that's how we ended up with name here the user help text is again whenever a user sees a page where they might uh, have to enter some data the tool tip or some sort of help text will be rendered out of this your display name and then the user will be shown a text box so there are i think three or four different controls that we have in ief one of them is text box uh, i think there's drop down there is a few radio buttons uh, check box 
in this case we are saying display name has to be uh, uh, given the in, i mean the user has to give input using a text box and from that text box will capture the display name any questions before i go to the next more compli complicated <laughs> This slide. It's complicated not because it is complicated. I think it will be complicated because of the way I'm presenting, which I'm trying my best to make simple. But as that's why I, I, I initially said that if you went to John's session and you came back here, uh, there you will feel the difference. <laughs> that's all I'll say. So given that claim type definition, the the output claims or the uh, uh, I won't. I, I will go into the difference of input claims, output claims, and persistent claims later. But in this case, I'll just pick one output claims. And I want to go through the steps that are taken to resolve the partner claim type. If you see a definition like this, the partner claim type belongs to the IDP. And all we are saying here is that last underscore name needs to be mapped to surname. So that's what that first line of output claim, claim type reference ID is equal to surname, partner claim type is equal to last underscore name means. That's all it means. That I'll get a token, uh, the same thing applies for SAML. If you get a SAML assertion, JWT token, I will look at last underscore name and in my system for the rest of this user journey, it is going to be referenced using surname. At a later point, I can go and say, I want to send this surname to another ID, to a uh, given IDP and I'm going to call it family name. And then we will do that translation and that request will contain family name and take the value from surname and put it in family name. So the first line has an explicit definition partner claim type. Whenever you see that definition, that wins. If it's in the uh, if it, if if it's, if it's declared right direct to uh, right next to the claim type reference ID with a partner claim type, we will always use that. If it does not exist, for example, the second line, then it will go back to claim schema and try to find a default partner claim type for that particular protocol. So in the case of display name, if we are dealing with Open ID Connect, we'll take name. Because one does not exist here, but it exists in the default. If the default did not exist, let's say if I were to go and just uh, remove this, uh, the section called default partner claim types, then display name itself becomes a partner claim type. So basically we'll say, oh, you, we have a display name. We don't have any definition for partner claim type. Maybe it's the display name that we need to really map. So that's how that resolution uh, resolution works. For output, uh, for uh, when the output claim type has a default value, for example, in the last, uh, if you look at the very last declaration, the default value is only applied to a claim if one does not exist uh, in the token that we are trying to process. So because these are all output claims, we are going to um, uh, open some JWT token, let's say a response came from Facebook. Facebook will typically not have identity provider in its responses. I mean, that, we just know that based on the experience. So we will actually assign facebook.com as a default, um, uh, uh, facebook.com as a value for identity provider. And then that can also be sent in the token so the app can know which identity provider was used for authentication. You, Is all of this case sensitive? It's not supposed to be case sensitive. XML is case sensitive. So we basically, as far as the IDs are concerned, we have done uh, uh, all the work required to make it case insensitive. Having said that, the value you put, we will preserve the case. So for example, if you say facebook.com all lowercase, we will send it as all lowercase in the token. So the app should not have to necessarily go and start uh, doing some case insensitive matches on the values. So values will try to preserve claim type IDs are case insensitive. You had a question. We don't have that in this declaration, but uh, when I uh, cover some claims transformations, you can basically write a claims transformation and force force a value. Um, so far, we haven't had the need to use that, but I mean, that's something we can uh, evaluate. Yeah. All right. Huh? So the question was, uh, is there a way to force a value, the default value? So this is a default value. So is there a, is there a way to 
override um, the value regardless of whether it exists in the system or not. And so the response is that today you can do that using claims transformations, which I'll cover later. Uh, the default value only applies as a default value if nothing else exists. All right, let's go through claims transformations. So the previous, uh, uh, the output claim example I showed you, we re refer to that as claim mapping. It's essentially mapping one claim to a different claim, a claim from one token into a claim that we are going to maintain in IEF. So it's just a claim type change. There is no manipulation of the values. Claim transformations gives you a way to manipulate the values. It is declared in the building block section and it is going to manipulate the claim value using some predefined methods. Those predefined methods are part of IEF. So IEF, for example, has maybe five or 10 or 15 claims transformation methods that are well-defined. I'll go through and show some of them uh, in the next slide. Only those methods can be used. It's not arbitrary. You cannot write, uh, uh, write random code. Uh, the reason I brought it up was because I've been asked this before, whether we can just go and write our own claims transformation. We don't support that today. Each uh, claims transformation has uh, three sections. Uh, it has input claims, output claims, and parameters. So input claim is basically the claim it's going to manipulate. There are uh, cases, we have found several cases where our transformation needs to work on multiple claims. And then it's going to output one, it can output one or multiple claims. Um, a very simple example of a transformation that needs to do multiple claims is when you, when you are dealing with a collection and you need to insert more claims into the same collection. So your input claims will contain two input claims. One is the collection, the other is the item. And then the output claim is a uh, modified collection. There are uh, other examples are where you need to basically take two claims and combine them, uh, for example, concatenate a string to create a, uh, a third claim. Or, or overwrite one of the existing claims. So one of the examples where we used that was, uh, 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 let's say, uh, this is actually probably uh, not, this is not something we do in Startup Pack, but I've uh, heard customers wanting to, wanting to do this. They wanted to take the first name and the last name and try to create a display name out of it. So they can basically write a transformation where it takes a first name and a last name and then does some string con concatenation or formatting to create the display name. So this I already covered. And so once the claims transformation is um, defined in the building blocks, it has to be invoked somewhere. So think of building blocks as just declarations. They basically have no power. They just say, this is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, think of it as a method you know, declaration, but un unless that method is called, it's not gonna make any difference to any claim. So the place to call claims transformation is in technical profiles. So technical profiles, um, let me actually go through that. Technical profiles have two, uh, two different ways uh, to look at it. There's a technical profile that is authored for an IDP. In the IDP context, the input claims are the claims that are sent to the IDP. Basically they are input to the IDP and then output claims are the claims that are output from the IDP. So it, the claims transformation may need to apply before the claim is sent to the IDP. So that, that's what input claims transformation uh, uh, element in the policy is. Input claims transformation will be applied, uh, will, will, uh, will be processed first. Claims transformations will be formed. New claims will be created in the system as a result of those transformations or existing ones will be modified. And then those will be sent or a subset of those can be sent to the uh, IDPs. When we get back the output claims, we take the output claims, IEF will uh, put it in the uh, claim bag, and then it will apply output claims transformations. And those end up being, uh, also go in the sort of a claim bag that it maintains. The, this case is uh, slightly different for uh, the technical profile that is declared for the relying party. In the relying party, the output is output from IEF to the relying party. And the input is what the uh, relying party sends the request to, uh, what comes in the request to IEF. So the easiest way to think about this is, a request will originate in the application, in the relying party app. It comes to IEF. Then request in, uh, originates in IEF, it goes to an external IDP. 
So that's an input, that's an input in the request. And then the response is the output from the IDP and the response is again the output from IEF. So if you think of it in terms of requests coming in and then responses going out of each system, it becomes easier to understand how this is modeled in the policy. So uh, in the case of uh, uh, the in the case of relying party context, the input claims come from the relying party, and then the input claims transformations are applied. So let's say we were getting, as an example, we got a token from some relying party, uh, and uh, in that token or request, we had some claim, or let's say first name, and we wanted to manipulate it for whatever reason, or we had first name, last name, and we wanted to manipulate into a display name we could set up an input claims transformation in the relying party technical profile and then attempt to manipulate it. And then the output claim, uh, once we uh, start processing the output claims, we will similarly apply output claims transformations. Questions? Some, these are some of the examples of um, claims transformations we have. Um, the transformation, these are, this is basically the list uh, of tra transformations that are declared in the startup pack. So one example uh, in the startup pack is create other mails from email. Other mails is a property in AD Graph API. Uh, it's a directory property. It is a collection of email addresses that belong to the user. A user may have one email address or they might have three, they might have five. And so uh, add item to string collection is uh, a transformation method that we invoke and we provide the email address and the collection in which that email address needs to be added. Once that method invokes, it does the manipulation and returns the co uh, collection back. And using this method, we can basically get one email address from, theoretically from Facebook and ask the user for other email address, another email address, and then create a collection and put it in the directory. So all of those scenarios become possible. The random UPN username and create user principal name, these are required primarily as a requirement for AD Graph API. If you have ever written code against AD, AD Graph API, uh, you very quickly find out that uh, in order to create a user object, you have to give this UPN name, uh, user principal name, and you also have to uh, give, um, I think, mail nickname and one more item. So, so there's two or three properties that are required, and one of them is display name. So in, ed in order to create a UPN a user principal name which is not uh, relevant in the social uh, accounts, we basically create a random UPN name. And the primary reason we create a random UPN name is because we do not want any deterministic UPN name creation because we found that when it was deterministic, applications tend to take a dependency on that. Because they tend to figure out, oh yeah, this works in this order, so I, can, I might as well just go and take a dependency. And we couldn't guarantee the consistency. So it's best for anybody to just go and try to do a random UPN name. I'll, I'll go, uh, skip the, uh, the, uh, the other few. Um, we'll come back to them later when we go through technical profiles and some of them will show up. Uh, so this is uh, the summary of how, uh, uh, how um, claims transformations uh, needs to be declared, your question? I'll ask Jose, is the full list documented of claims transformations? No, it's not. So today, the full list is what's in the startup pack. That's the sample. Uh, I, I think we probably uh, can go back and look at uh, some of the additional ones and then start uh, exposing those as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of what? <laughs> this one? <laughs> so in short, this slide is basically a summary. Uh, you declare in building blocks the claim transformation, give it an ID. It will always be referenced using ID. In fact, that's, a, that's generally the rule in the policy. Every element will have an ID or it cannot be referenced. We will not, we do not want to reference anything other than the ID. A lot of elements with, will have display names and those are the names that are shown to the user and we want to always distinguish between what machine looks at and what human looks at. Because what human looks at will change in multiple places. It will change in localization, it will change just because the English string is not adequate and needs to be changed over time. 
but the machine ID we want it to be consistent. Changing a machine ID is typically a breaking change. So you, when you create a claims transformation, whatever ID you pick, that is the ID that will be referenced in that policy and all the policies that reference that policy. The method will show up as a transformation method uh, uh, from a predefined list, uh, which, like I said, right now startup pack is your best uh, you know, documentation for that, but uh, we, will, we will make it public. And then um, the input and output claims of every transformation method are also fixed. There is no, uh, I mean, there is, it's not a guess or something to figure out. It's basically for every method, it is known that this method requires one input claim, or in this case, it requires two input claims. One will have a transformation claim type as item, and the other is collection. And the relationship or the mapping here is similar to the mapping I talked about between uh, an IDP and IEF, which is there's a partner claim type, and then there's a claim type in the system. Similarly, there's a transformation claim type. Think For a second, think of claims transformation as a separate service or microservice running somewhere, just for uh, con conceptual clarity. We are still going to take some claim from the user journey that is executing and then send it over to that transformation that's going to manipulate it and give back a response. So that is transformation claim type. And that transformation method is only recognizing these two claim types as input claim types and only one claim type as the output claim type. So in this case, essentially we take other mails, we are going to add the email claim to it and get back other mails in our system. So there's no new claim that is being created and existing claim is being modified. The last section is an example of how it is used. In this case, it's a, there's a technical profile that will say input claims transformations and then has a reference ID, create other mails from email, which was a name that was declared in the building block section. Only when that technical profile is invoked, and just before it's going to send claims to an IDP, it will apply those transformations, whatever shows up in input claims transformation section. Easy? Questions? Yes, yes. Not today, we don't support that. Because that's the same as once you define it, so, um, uh, later on in the second se uh, session, Ronnie will go through how to invoke a REST API. So you can basically do similar transformation in your own REST API. So then that is code managed by you because you're writing some code, you could be doing a lot of manipulation, it could be expensive in terms of compute. IEF is not going to host that code. So you can make an external call and do it. If you were to define your own transformation method, then those questions start coming up. How do we scale? Who manages that code and all of that? So we don't want to do that and security, of course. All right, I'll move to the next session unless there's more questions. Either everybody understood everything or I completely confused everyone. And <laughs> people are saying, what the hell, this guy, you know, I'll just stay here to be nice, but this sucks, yes. Okay, so the question again is, is there a document? <laughs> is it documented basically, right? So uh, we will document it. Uh, Jose has uh, said that already. And so today, uh, I think you can start by the, with, the claims with the transformation methods that are already in the startup pack. But very soon we should try, we will make an announcement saying the documentation is available here. All right, yes. Can you say one more time why other emails listed as an input claim and an output claim? Right. So, um, uh, going back to my anal an, uh, analogy of a separate service hosting the transformation method and IEF uh, sending some claims over, and then it getting back a response, and then it needs to figure out what to do with that response. And we are saying, hey, in that response, there is a claim called collection, map that back to other mails. So we essentially override it. That's not how the architecture is, but that's the easiest way to think about it. We want to think about a uh, transformation method as sort of an entity in itself, which has a very clear line of what goes in and what comes out. So we modeled it similarly to uh, IDPs. All right, so then we'll start with content definitions. Content definitions is our best friend uh, for uh, 
modifying the UX. Uh, essentially, the way we have content definitions uh, in the policy, the, it's again in the building blocks section of the policy. Um, it is referenced in either a user journey step or in a technical profile. Uh, we'll go, go through that. Uh, I'll, I'll show some references later in the same uh, slide deck. Uh, but every time it is referenced, the reference is specific to a content definition for that particular page that needs to show UI. For example, there is one control in IEF that shows the identity providers on a screen. We call it IDP selection page. The content definition for IDP selection page is different from the content definition for, uh, for example, self-asserted provider, which is shown to the UI to uh, where, where they can uh, go and write their display name or first name or whatever they want to uh, add, add uh, in, in the controls. In order for IEF to differentiate how to process each of or how to render each of those pages and how to process them correctly, uh, the content definition has what is called uh, data URI. And data URI is these, uh, th these are basically hard coded values for each data URI. And these values are basically provided by IEF saying for each, for this page, the data URI must be this. For this page, the data URI must be this. Think of data URI as a way for um, IEF to go and find the right content to render that page. So it's internal to IEF. It's basically a, a hard-coded reference. Uh, th this is basically, I think this is the complete list of all the data URIs. So this is documented on this slide. And we will make this slide deck public. <laughs> um, so this, this is an example of the IDP selection page. Um, the, the, I think we have a demo later for wingtip games. Uh, so essentially what's happening is on the right-hand bottom side, we have the default, uh, default uh, uh, I would say, customization. It's not like customization, it's the default UX, user experience. But for wingtip games, basically uh, the content uh, uh, definitions have been modified to render a very different experience. So that, uh, I'll show later. Essentially, the, uh, in this, this example, and uh, we have seen with a lot of our, our customers that they are able to go and completely modify the entire uh, outlook of the page by changing or providing their own HTML. Um, and I'll come to that later. Yes? So they, uh, only for IDP selections, uh, IDP selections do not have a technical profile. Uh, yeah, so they can be referenced in technical profile. The example of that is self-asserted provider, right? So in the self-asserted provider, the user is seeing a page based on a technical profile. But on the IDP selections page, they are not seeing it based on a technical profile. They, are, they see that based on a step that says IDP selection. I'll show an example of that. So this is, this is basically a content definition for IDP selections page, the one that we just showed you. And we just call it content definition API.idbselection.signin. And then uh, there, is a, there is a localization um, aspect to it. You can also localize in different languages. Uh, it could be English, it could be French. And there is a, the, the, so that reference, as a best practice, we try to prefix it with the same ID that we use for the main content definition. That's a bug. It should not be. <laughs> the second one should say uh, localized resource reference language is equal to FR. And th because uh, that language represents what comes in the request uh, to, uh, from the browser to IEF. So if IEF, uh, IEF sees EN as the language, it will take resources from this, from the first uh, uh, localized ref resource reference ID. If it finds FR as a string either in the browser or explicitly in the request, then it will go to the second localized resources reference. So this is most probably some prototype where uh, the language is incorrect. Right, so let's get back to, so this is the multi-factor authentication page. This is also uh, uh, the one that you're seeing is in the default uh, configuration, uh, default UX. And this one can be uh, similarly modified by giving a URN of multi-factor page. Actually, let me step back and go through one more thing. 
So in the content definition, you'll see there's a load URI, recovery URI, and data URI. So when this reference is made to api.idpselection.signin, it must have that data URI which matches the IDP selection page. Based on that data URI, uh, IEF is going to go and find the content that IEF needs. So that includes the JavaScript you will download on the client, for example. That will include a few other elements that you will send back to the client. But the load URI is something that you can modify. And you can point to your own HTML or CSS HTML. Typically, CSS HTML, so you can dynamically process some, uh, some uh, parameters. And what IEF is going to do is, um, from the client, it's going to attempt to download that CSS HTML. And if it succeeds uh, in downloading that CSS HTML, it's going to use that to render everything. And that CSS HTML must have uh, one fixed tab. Uh, by the way, all of this is documented uh, on the no, I think I should keep saying that, what is documented. So this one is documented, for sure. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, so you have to set some course settings and everything to allow uh, the content to be downloaded. Uh, but um, once it downloads the CSS HTML, there is a special div that will be replaced by IEF at runtime. So you basically, you can go and do whatever you want in, the, uh, in your CSS HTML. But one place you will say div ID is equal to API. That IEF will go find that in CSS HTML, modify it, put all the controls that it needs to put, and then let the browser render that, that, that HTML file. Um, since the, uh, the control IDs are well-defined uh, and classes are well-defined, uh, you can also apply your own CSS to controls that are inserted into the CSS HTML by IEF. So all of that, uh, th that is possible. So I'll continue forward. Uh, this is the multi-factor page I already showed. Um, this is the example of a self-asserted page. Uh, these are just uh, different examples. Um, the recovery URI uh, is used when there is an error on the page. Uh, sometimes you might want a different URI, uh, different, page, different styling or different messages to show up on the page so you can modify it as well. Self-asserted, same thing. Uh, Self-asserted is used in two places. Uh, one place is the self-asserted provider, and the other one is uh, when uh, sign-up or sign-in page is rendered. We also use self-asserted provider behind the scenes. So declaring your own uh, content definition, uh, same concept. It's going to be universal concept. You declare your content definition in the building block section. You go copy-paste an existing content definition, modify it, Create a new one, you can leave the old one as is instead of modifying it if you want to keep it. And then in the orchestration step or technical profile, you change the ID. In this example, this is an example where it's not in the technical profile, it's in the orchestration step. So if you look at orchestration step, order is equal to one. If you open the starter pack today, you'll see this as is, where the content definition reference ID is equal to API.idp selections page. Because this step does not has that does not have any technical profile. It's only about different selections. And so uh, the step defines the content definition reference ID. And when that step is being executed, we'll go to that content definition, download all the content, and figure it out, and then display, it, display it to the user. The second example of API definition in the technical profile, I'll cover that when I go more into detail uh, about technical profiles uh, in the other session. Any questions before I move on? This is all about content definitions. Yes. Yeah, so metadata is, uh, think of metadata in general, you will see it in the policy. There, uh, the principle behind metadata is that there are certain aspects that are universal across everything. For example, uh, when you have an identity provider, there, are, there is going to be some input claims, there's going to be output claims, there is going to be uh, uh, some transformations, protocol, all of that is universal across all technical profiles, more or less. But then there are some things that are specific to that particular provider or protocol. So those kind of things comes in, come in the metadata. So those are not sort of burnt into the schema because of that need for the flexibility. But uh, you st still need to provide that before that technical profile or in this case the, uh, the um, content definition can work. The metadata can be optional or required, and that also depends on the protocol. So some protocols, for example, in OpenID Connect or Auth2, there is some elements that are not required, 
uh, if you provide the, uh, in, in the case of OpenID Connect, if you give the discovery endpoint, we'll take a lot of data from that and try to use it. But if you want to modify something or provide it yourself, you, you, you can optionally do that. In this case, both the display name and language.intro are actually optional. This is a basically uh, a mechanism to say when rendering this um, API uh, dot IDP selections this page, I want to change the display name from whatever default Microsoft gave me. So this is a way of doing that. This uh, we are going to remove uh, uh, this metadata, specifically these two lines from the startup pack because we are uh, coming up with a new feature for localization. And localization allows you to basically go and say for English, I want to use this string whenever an English request comes. And so that kind of makes it obsolete at that point. So we'll try to do it from startup pack, just get rid of it and then use the localized, localized resources. So how would I know that I need this metadata piece for this So in this case, it was uh, basically, uh, think of it as something that needed to be told it needed to be documented, for example. But in the localization feature, we have a very uh, well-defined algorithm. For example, uh, we will say that you need to declare this as element type and this as you know string type or string ID. And then that string ID can be all of these strings on the page. So you as a developer can go open the page, find the string ID, and then come back to the policy and modify it. So we, we are moving into that direction. But in this case, and that is partly also the reason of sort of replacing this with that. Right, let's move on. Um, so orchestration steps. Um, so we, I have mentioned user journeys a couple of times. Um, the, uh, the goal with our user journeys was that we want it to be composable and user experience. We wanted it to be defined through policies. So ideally you would not have to write any code in order to create a user journey. And uh, we believe that Today, that is pretty much possible. And it's, it has to be customizable enough, the mean bar being that ideally, when an application starts and then it sends the user for an authentication experience, the user should not figure out that it's going to a different system. That is our goal. So um, it should be the same as if the application itself was doing the authentication experience. So that is the level of customization we wanted to give, and that is the reason we have a lot of this CSS HTML, go write your own HTML, CSS, and try to modify it. So this is an example of uh, uh, a sample user journey, how it's executed. I went through it yesterday already. You go through step one, we go through a step two, and then we basically, IEF will go through each one of them. The IEF orchestration engine works simply by user journeys. So a policy comes in, Policy will have a policy ID. Policy ID must have a default user journey. And then the user journey is executed. There is no other way to invoke a policy. It will always happen through a user journey. In the B2C basic, uh, in the B2C sort of blades that you see on the admin portal, when you go and create a new policy and it says sign up or sign in policies or these policies or that policies, that's essentially because those policies have default user journey set to sign up or sign in. Default user journey set to sign up, profile edit, password reset and so forth. So that is basically the crux of, uh, of the system here, especially the execution part of it. At the end, there is a last, typically a last step that will say send claims and we'll issue the tokens uh, to, the, to uh, uh, you, uh, the application. Now, during the user journey execution, we can also have preconditions. I talked briefly about preconditions yesterday, so I'll go into more details about that, uh, that today. The preconditions can be invoked based on uh, two different, uh, actually preconditions are always invoked based on the value of the claims. But the value of the claims can result from multiple sources. One source can be it came from a technical profile. Uh, it can come from a validation technical profile that will go into detail as well. Uh, it can also be a claim that was provided by the user or it can be a claim that was declared as a default with a default value in one of the technical profiles. So for example, in the previous example, I showed um, identity provider set to facebook.com. We can have, add a precondition saying if identity, pro, uh, identity provider is facebook.com, skip this step. Or if it's not facebook.com, skip this step and do something specific for facebook.com. Okay, so let's. Um, so this is an example of uh, a precondition. So preconditions, we have two, uh, two uh, conditions today. 
one condition is the existence of a claim and the other condition is uh, when two claim values are uh, they match so in the first example we have precondition type is equal to claims exist these types are also well defined types you we only have two claims exists a claim exists and claim equals and um, we whether we want to execute the action of the precondition on the value being true or false is uh, is, is defined along with that uh, precondition type this may seem a little bit complex but the important thing to note is that there is no precondition where the action will be execute this step because by default all the orchestration steps are supposed to be executed so the precondition will typically always say that if this condition is true skip this step that is the only precondition action available today so in both of these examples we have action set to skip this orchestration step but what you can swap out or change is whether you want to skip it on value being true or false so you can either say if this claim exists skip this step or if the claim does not exist skip this step the example in the context of uh, the uh, the identity provider claim could be that if let's say we wanted to execute a step uh, sorry skip a step if authentication had taken through uh, place uh, taken place through any idp we could say if identity provider uh, claim exists skip this step so it will only be executed in the local account case we generally in the starter pack do not do that we typically have uh, one claim declared for each purpose so identity provider claim is declared specifically to find out which identity provider issued the token and then we have an authentication source that specifies whether it's social or local or something else and then we do something similar with social and uh, with the authentication source so in the case of authentication source we will typically say if authentication source is local account authentication then skip this step or if authentication source is uh, social idp authentication then skip this step you have a question yes. is there any way to debug it uh, uh, i don't huh record i think uh, uh, the best way to do it is uh, i would say try uh, application insights that is something we went out with uh, the public preview with so in the application insights we log a bunch of actions based on how the user journey uh, user journey is executing so a lot of this data goes in the uh, in the application insights as well try it out it's a, uh, we just uh, did that a couple of months ago uh, so there probably are gaps send us feedback and if you're completely blocked we will then try to figure out what we can add in use uh, in application insights and also try to unblock you so we'll try to do that but uh, there is two different types of debugging one is the policy uh, the static shape and content of the policy we try to validate the policy when you're uploading so often time people upload the policy it says oh this error found and this error found and this error found the dynamic part is harder for us to evaluate at the upload time so for that we have uh, this data feeding into application insights if you go to the starter pack page one of the uh, the reference documents has instructions on how to start the application inside set, set it up all right any other questions yes sir no so domain hint we don't uh, we don't uh, you, you will not go to a particular identity provider uh, uh, by writing uh, preconditions when the idp selections page is shown ief looks at the domain hint it goes to the technical profiles that are related to the, that idp selection page and each technical profile can have a domain hint specified in the technical profile and so it does a match because uh, when you have a domain hint all it's going to do is redirect to a particular idp but typically after that the regular flow will continue so think of think of domain hint as just uh, is just mapping uh, in the first step mapping the selection on behalf of the user 
That's all it's doing. It's not preconditions or any of that. Because uh, it's basically saying, hey, user kind of, I want to make a selection for the user already, that's it. So that's how it ends up skipping that step and going to the second step. Okay. So we, so th this is basically the same user journey uh, summarized, uh, uh, where uh, all we are saying is, um, in the local account, sign uh, sign up with uh, sign up or sign in with local account and social IDP. These all steps have preconditions. I already uh, briefly went through it yesterday, where we are going to skip one or the other depending on d d d different um, different uh, conditions and uh, claim values and whether claim exists or not. I will uh, let Ronnie, um, in the interest of time, have him come and go through the key management. Um, After this slide, let me just do very quickly one, one more slide. So when we define uh, when we define um, uh, technical profiles, uh, and if you remember, I was going through uh, originally. I was going through uh, this uh, list of uh, uh, in the technical profiles. You can have different protocols. So the list of protocols and providers uh, or uh, providers is uh, on, on this slide. The self-asserted provider or the phone factor, they are not standard protocols. So we have in the policy what we call a provider, and then you have a fully qualified name like web.tpengine.providers.restful-provider. But if you have a standard protocol, then that's basically the standard processing that will happen as part of the protocol. So if you're going to Facebook or, or, or Google, you can use OpenID Connect or Auth2. But that does not apply for Azure AD Graph. That does not apply for phone factor or Azure AD MF, uh, MFA, that does not apply for REST, uh, REST API. So for that, we have our own providers because they're not standard uh, protocols. And then we go and try to use those providers in order to communicate with all these external, uh, external IDPs. So I think let's uh, get to key management and let's have Ronnie on the stage. So I'll cover about these. Uh, I just wanted to give an intro to, the, uh, to these, uh, but I, I'm going to cover more about each one of them in the next section. Okay. Finally, finally, something simple, key management. So, so before we, we go there, uh, who has gone to the portal and in the IEF section and created some keys already? Most of you, I hope. So in sake of time, uh, I, I just wanted to share the concepts, the key concepts behind it. There is a whole bunch of slides in there, uh, which you have already done in reality. Uh, so I'm not gonna, gonna take the time here, uh, and you can have a little bit of break between the sessions. So basically, uh, one of the key aspects we have actually added to the, uh, to the service, and this was announced in preview on Build earlier this year, is um, actually a, a unified way to do key management on, 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 on B2C. And this is based on a standard called JSON Web Keys. So whether you uh, want to generate uh, or upload uh, RSA keys or secrets or certificates, uh, basically they are all stored in these JSON Web Keys and you can actually view them in the, in, in the blades when you, when you go to the key management section. Uh, now, a very important element of that is that you can actually keep on adding new keys to an existing key. And so why, why do we do that? So this is basically uh, about key rolling. So key rolling is a, is a very good principle in security. Uh, so cryptographic keys need to be refreshed. Uh, let's say an RSA key every year, you need to refresh it. And so basically, you can actually add a new key. And the key will be in a certain state, and there are three states. So within, within the UI, you will see you can actually set an expiry date on a key. <laughs> Clearly, if that expiry date hits, the key will be expired. That's one state. You can also say a not before uh, a date in the UI. So when that, um, uh, when that date hasn't reached, this is kind of future key. This will be used in the future. And then, basically, you have uh, other keys 
which are like active keys. Uh, so these are the keys that are going to be used at this moment. But you can have multiple. You can keep on adding keys. So now you might have two, three keys, which are actually not expired and they're not future keys. So we have a very simple algorithm there. The last key that you added, for instance, last signing key that you added, uh, is the one who is going to be used to sign, for instance, a token. So th this, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, concept to understand. So then maybe one more thing. So uh, most of the cases, you will just go into the blade and generate the key. Uh, so in the starter pack uh, for the token signing and for the refresh uh, token encryption, you just generate a key. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's your key, which is specific to your tenant. Um, the other example is, for instance, Facebook. Uh, so uh, in the starter pack, you, you actually uh, can set up a social uh, relationship with Facebook. So you go to Facebook and you get a client ID back and you get a client secret. This is actually a relationship, a contract between your tenant and Facebook. So you cannot just generate a key. So you, you need a way to set a key which Facebook will understand and, and, and can, can validate. So in the, in, in the blades, you can actually uh, set specific values for the key. So you have generate, it's a random value which is being generated, or you can say, I want to set it manually. And that's the part you would typically use with, with, with Facebook and other kind of providers. With this, I think uh, I have explained concepts, but are there any questions about key management you would like to hear? Phil? Yeah, so um, the question is, are, uh, are we intending to use Key Vault? So to start with, within the service, we use Key Vault at a whole bunch of different places. Huh? So the keys we actually use ourselves to, uh, uh, to, to protect our service, they all are stored in Key Vault. And this is some uh, Key Vault, having support in Key Vault, is, is the design of the key management is actually made so we can actually go to external uh, key storages. It is not yet uh, enabled in the service, but it's clearly something we have on the roadmap. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, um, it's very hard to hear you. Yeah. Possible. Oh, you scare me. <laughs> Is it possible to uh, dynamically set key at runtime? Uh, the scenario that I'm going for is, uh, I was talking to somebody on the engineering team yesterday, and they mentioned that uh, uh, for open ID Connect protocol, uh, you can get the URL endpoints through a REST provider, and you can set that in. Uh, obviously, uh, for open ID protocol, if you're just doing the ID token and you're doing implicit flow, you don't need any keys and everything is fine. But if you want to go through the, uh, the code uh, code workflow, you are going to need a secret key that you need to uh, then redeem the code with. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, is, is there a provision for you to set the uh, keys programmatically at runtime through a restful provider? So, if there's a key vault kind of thing, then I can just call the key vault and just set the key. And you guys read the key from the key vault. Yeah, so um, this is definitely, that's what I meant. So the, um, so the question was basically, can, you, can, we, can we basically uh, uh, get during runtime keys from, for instance, Key Vault? And so basically the, um, uh, the design that we made in key management is to, uh, uh, to be quite open on, uh, uh, let's call it uh, external HSMs. And Key Vault is, a, is, a, is an example of an external HSM. Uh, today, this isn't uh, uh, exposed through the service, but that's definitely something we're looking for in the roadmap. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. So uh, um, the, the, the point of Vikram is, uh, so we are actually um, uh, implementing programmatic uh, uh, API through Graph, Microsoft Graph, and so through that mechanism, you would be able to do that too. Everybody's anxious for coffee? OK. Oh. 
Okay. What's happening here? Omar, what did you do to my machine? Not give your machine to untrusted parties. <laughs> I seem to have a problem opening different tabs. So. Yeah, so oops. something is frozen here. So, but basically, yeah, I can do it in the next session. Yeah, so uh, sorry for that. Phil? So best practices for certificates. So, uh, so basically, yes, there are. And so, um, uh, so, every, so there are different communities, like the cryptographic communities, that are basically every year, for instance, on the RSA conference, you have this um, uh, crypto panel uh, that address these kind of things, because this is very dynamic. Huh? So uh, uh, today, RSA, by default, we use 2048 bits, uh, which is a quite big key. So um, that's, that's seen as a, a, a safe bet today. But you know, uh, RSA is as safe as the, um, uh, the crypto analysts' capability to factor the, the key. Uh, and so there are, sometimes there is uh, progress in these kind of things. People also uh, uh, built actually machines to do this kind of thing. So it's a very dynamic problem. And so the, the advice is basically to, uh, that's what we do, watch out for the uh, cryptographic uh, community and, and actually collect their advice for the, for the key lengths. And we can change the defaults very easily. A roll off, sorry? Yeah, so um, uh, again, this is, this is part of the same kind of uh, advice. So, what they, what they basically will stipulate is that uh, if you take a key for 2048 bits, it is going to be valid for, let's say, two years. Um, so, we actually, uh, so one of the things is. Um, uh, we are actually working at this moment on a, on a concept to, uh, to do much more key management on behalf of, uh, uh, of you, actually, and to make that, that rolling much more uh, programmatic and much more simpler for you. So that's also something which we still have in the roadmap. Um, so to make this kind of rolling much more controlled by you and say, OK, uh, once, once we can do it in that way, you could actually roll your key every week by means of speaking. That's maybe an overkill, but you could do it. So think about this. Um, if we can create a system like this, where basically the time it takes for an attacker to get to a key is much longer than for you to roll it, then you're pretty safe. So that's the kind of uh, uh, pattern we're working on. Okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs>